Feed the neighborhood with a tailgate ready big bow box. And it's bow time. I'm Tommy Garganis. Here with me is David Taylor. He was the women's broadcaster for the JMU women's basketball team for 38 years. And a few months ago, he got the chance to uh, do another basketball game for the men's game against Coastal Carolina with Kurt Dudley. So first off, David, thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you very much, Tommy. Pleasure to be here. To start things off, David, you know, how did it feel, you know, covering that Coastal Carolina game after, you know, kind of stepping away for a while? Well, I've had a chance to do some TV games with Kurt over the last several years, and uh, and it was it was it was a thrill to watch this year's men's basketball team. You know, Coach Byington and that group. Uh, you know, obviously one of the one of the, if not the greatest year in in men's basketball history at James Madison University, and certainly that day against Coastal Carolina, they were out in force and played extremely well. Going back to you know. Your 38-year career with the, covering the women's team. What were some of your favorite moments from that? Well, I, I had great fortune to be a part of watching the women's basketball program develop from pre-NCAA years. In fact, uh, my first my first game with the women's basketball at JMU was in 1978, and uh, that was in actually the first year that the Dukes or the Duchesses, as they were called at that time, uh, were uh, 20 game winners. Uh, they made it to what was then a state final against an Old Dominion team that eventually went on and won the national championship that year. Um, but I saw the women's game grow over the years to, you know, obviously we've seen, you know, just in this past weekend, how amazing the women's basketball game has become. And it's, it's fascinating to think how central in many ways JMU uh, has been to that. Um, in fact, the, the coach that I first worked with, Betty Janes, who's being inducted into the Hall of Fame this year at JMU, uh, she actually hosted the 1975 National Championship for women's basketball at Godwin Hall. It's one of the things that I think few people really, really know was happening um, here on this campus. Uh, of course, the program is fourth all time in, in wins. Um, I got the opportunity to work not just with Coach James, but also with Coach uh, Sheila Mormon, another Hall of Famer, and then my very good friend Kenny Brooks, who had an amazing 14-year run here, went on to take Virginia Tech to the Final Four, and is now the head coach at the University of Kentucky. Uh, just a, a tremendous career and a, and a fantastic person. But without a doubt, in all of that span, uh, going back to 1991 and Sheila Mormon's last Sweet 16 team that reached the Sweet 16. It probably wasn't Sheila's most talented team. And uh, they, they got, uh, it was a 48-team tournament then, so they played an early round and then were matched up against the number one seed in the tournament, not just in the region, but the number one ranked team in the country in Penn State. Uh, they beat Kentucky, interestingly enough, in the first round at uh, the Convocation Center and advanced to play Kentucky. And there weren't odds during those days, but if the odds had been out, the Dukes would have been probably 20, 25 point uh, uh, underdogs going into that. And it looked like it was going to be that kind of game. Uh, probably 10 minutes in, I remember it was 24 to 9, and Coach Mormon had called a timeout. Uh, but that group, that played so well as a team and, and won, I think at one point, 21 games in a row that year, managed to get back within, I don't know, six or seven points at halftime. And then all of a sudden, things they began to believe that it could happen in the second half, playing at Penn State in front of a, a packed house in the old arena there with 6,000 people. Uh, probably the most, uh, the highlight of my radio broadcast career was uh, being able to call the final moments of that game when Penn State's uh, three-point shot at the end of the game was blocked and the Dukes won by two um, and advanced to the Sweet 16 over the number one team in the country. At that time, the biggest upset in the history of, of women's college basketball. Um, and that team went on and played the following week in the Sweet 16, lost on a last second shot to Clemson had they not lost that game, they would have played UConn in the regional final. That was Gino Ariema's first trip to the Final Four. So there was a lot of historical connections in there with that group. But I'll never forget Janine Michelson, 
who was a, a, a lanky forward on that 1991 team with a block shot of the, of the three to give the Dukes that incredible win. I mean, talking about um, some of the people that you've worked with, you know, you had a long career and you've got to work with a lot of different type of people. Well, talk specifically about like the people you've worked on with the broadcasting team. Oh, you know, there are so many and so many people have been uh, instrumental in, in uh, what I was able to do and the opportunities that, uh, that, that I had. Uh, uh, you know, Rich Murray was a, a sports information director at JMU uh, when I applied for an open position on the JMU uh, broadcast team and he offered me the, the women's position. And, uh, you know, he, he had uh, kind of set some standards for what he wanted the, the program to be like and, um, and, and it, it became a very professional environment that I got involved in. Uh, Tom Delaney Sloniker uh, was a, a friend of mine that I worked with a lot. He and I also worked high school games here locally during Ralph Sampson's junior and senior years, which were, that, that was an amazing experience. I got to meet college basketball coaches who were recruiting Ralph Sampson from all across the country. Um, uh, Mike Schickman and I worked for many, many years, Mike uh, over at WSVA, and of course, Kurt Dudley. Uh, you know, Kurt and I, our history has been intertwined for so many years. Uh, my first full-time job at the university was in the sports information office. And I left that position to move into public information uh, and start a little bit different uh, professional career. And that position is the one that Kurt came into, and in, I guess it was 1988. Um, and then it was later on when uh, I stepped away from the football broadcast in 1999 that Kurt filled into that slot, and then of course Kurt really at that point with uh, uh, under Jeff Warren and, and with the athletic administration began to envision what sports coverage needed to be like in the future. And I give Kurt so much credit for his vision of what streaming needed to be. You know, we started off with, with uh, audio streaming and advanced it beyond that to video streaming with Matazone and um, uh, Kurt's vision and his perseverance and his dedication to professionalism really put JMU at the position that it needed to be in when uh, the university made the transition to the Sun Belt and to FBS football. Uh, we already had the professional standards in place that were necessary to work with ESPN Plus and a lot of that credit goes to Kurt. Talking more about you know the Mad Zone and ESPN Plus, uh, can you talk any more about what it's been like to see that change over time? So one of the things for me was radio was always my my first love. I had the opportunity in high school, uh, in my sophomore year in high school, to work for the local radio station and to start doing some sports uh, broadcasting there. Uh, there really weren't people around to tell me how to do things, so it was more listening to people that I, I appreciated. Uh, people like John Gordon, who was the play-by-play -play man at the University of Virginia at that time, and someone that I had the opportunity to, to meet and, and sit through a game with him. Uh, Vin Scully, who I never met, but who, who was obviously one of the all-time greats. Uh, those kinds of individuals that I, I tried to uh, listen and learn from and, and model my technique as much as I could uh, after them. Um, so, you know, TV's been more of a recent thing, given the internet, given the ability uh, to, uh, to, to do streaming and to really create the opportunity for so many sports to be delivered. Um, uh, in many ways, I never really kind of connected to the video side of things. You know, the radio side, you've got, you've got your voice, you've got, you've got your tempo, you've got the pitch, you've got um, your loudness, you've got your word choice, you're creating picture for those who are, are experiencing your broadcast. Uh, when you move to TV, which I've done recently, uh, but never really connected with, to be honest, um, you know, the fans can see what's going on there. Uh, so the, 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 the person who's on the air doing analyst or play-by-play or -play has to add something additional to that, has to add something above and beyond what is, is there on the screen. 
Um, I, uh, I never really felt like I had the engagement with that that I did with, that I, that I did with radio. Radio was something that I, I felt at one with and, uh, and thoroughly enjoyed. And uh, of course, during those days, that was how people experienced the game. They, they were either there or they were listening on the radio because it wasn't available on, on TV or on internet streaming. Uh, so things have definitely changed. And as a fan now, I thoroughly enjoy, you know, being able to be, you know, if I'm out of town, I can still watch the lacrosse game uh, or the softball game, uh, as well as football and men's and women's basketball. Uh, it's amazing. And uh, I think that uh, there's never been a time, a better time to be a fan of college sports than now. Finally, do you think you could talk a little bit more about, you know, the ESPN Plus opportunities that Kyle offers for students? What do you kind of think about, you know, the chance to help Jamie's students get to get involved? I think that's amazing, and I really appreciate the approach that the university is taking, getting students involved in all levels of, of production. You know, there weren't those kinds of programs when I came along, but it was uh, wonderful people who gave me the opportunity to get my feet wet, to get some experience, to make some mistakes, you know, certainly along the way, and to grow from those and to get that professional experience that was necessary. And I ended up with, you know, 46 years in one level or another of being involved in, in sports broadcasting. Never as a full-time job, that was never my full-time job, it was always the, the thing that I did on the side. But it was such an important part of my life, and I think uh, one of the reasons that, that, that I, when I talked to Kurt and said, I think it's time for me to step away, was, was that, was there need to be more opportunities for young people to get those kinds of opportunities and exposure. Uh, and so I think that, I think it fits so well within the educational model of the university. Um, and I think it fits so well within the uh, professional concept that's in place at JMU. Yeah, well, David, thanks so much for joining me and sharing your experience. Really appreciate it. Enjoyed it, Tommy. Thank you.